Man-Thing is one of those comic book characters that is somewhat baffling because this muck-encrusted monstrosity doesn't actually have a character. He, or more accurately, it, is utterly incapable of emotion, speech, or an internal dialogue. And its only defining characteristic, other than being composed of swamp goo, is it's attracted to strong emotions. If that emotion is fear, Man-Thing is compelled to reach out and burn that fear away. And that is the entire spectrum of activity it's capable of. Do nothing, wander aimlessly, burn someone, punch an alligator, now back to nothing. So this is a character that's incapable of having a traditional character arc, or any arc actually. No matter where it starts and what it experiences, it always ends up at exactly the same point, completely unchanged. More to the point, it never drives the story forward. That's the burden of the supporting cast for each story. Man-Thing only reacts to the circumstances happening around it. I might even go so far as to say it's not a protagonist, it's a plot device. Despite all of this, Man-Thing has had three ongoing series, three miniseries, and numerous backup stories and appearances in other comic book titles. Man-Thing has remained essentially unchanged since its creation back in 1971. That is unusual, especially for a mainstream comic book character. All things considered, it's not exactly a character capable of change, so I suppose that's not too surprising. According to longtime Marvel editor Roy Thomas, it was Stan Lee who came up with the very loose concept of the creature, and it was Thomas who fleshed out the details before handing it over to Jerry Conway to write the full script. By the way, the name Man-Thing was the generic name Stan Lee used to describe creatures that used to appear in the Marvel Comics anthology title Tales of Suspense. Oddly enough, both Marvel Comics Man-Thing and its DC counterpart, Swamp Thing, were created at the same time. In fact, both debuted almost simultaneously. And when both characters got their own solo series, those series also debuted at the same time. What's equally strange is that the writer of Man-Thing, Jerry Conway, and the creator of Swamp Thing, Len Wein, were roommates at the time both characters were being created. Now, I'm not suggesting there was a conspiracy between the two writers to coordinate and sell basically the same story to two different companies, but it is a weird coincidence. After all, both characters have almost exactly the same origin. However, the characters did dramatically diverge from one another after their debut, so this may very well be what exactly happened in 1971. Regardless, Man-Thing debuted in the black and white magazine Savage Tales No. 1. This magazine was intended to last a lot longer than one issue, but for various reasons. This magazine sold poorly, and it was abruptly cancelled before any other issues were printed. That left Man-Thing in limbo for a year. A seven-page story, illustrated by the very hot artist, Neil Adams, had been drawn for the now-cancelled second issue of Savage Tales, and these pages were subsequently forced into the pages of the comic book, Kazar. It is one of the most clunky transitions ever seen in a comic book. These pages look so out of place and awkward that you can't help but wonder if the pages were accidentally inserted by the printing company. Of course, this led to a team-up between Kazar and Swamp Thing for two issues. And I'm going to gracefully sidestep that awkward team-up without further comment. Three months later, Man-Thing would begin a successful run in the anthology title Adventure into Fear, between issues 10 and 19. The first story was written by the original writer, Jerry Conway, but in the following issue, the character was handed to a new Marvel writer, the one, the only, Steve Gerber. Believe it or not, it's just me. Gerber would define the character, give it a reason to exist, and establish the mold all others would follow once he left the title. First, let's take a quick look at the actual origin of the character. Man-Thing began as the scientist, Ted Salas, who was trying to duplicate the super soldier formula that created Captain America. His reason for being in a swamp was to meet with a government agent and to hand that agent the only sample he had produced of the serum. Unfortunately, his lady friend, Ellen Brandt, sold him out to the evil science organization, AIM, and they attempt to take this sample from Salas. Salas escapes, and while he drives away, he injects himself with the serum to protect it from being taken by AIM. Salas crashes his speeding vehicle into the swamp. The swamp goo and the serum interact, changing Salas into the muck-encrusted monstrosity, Man-Thing. This is why Man-Thing is attracted to and subsequently burns whatever is filled with fear. His final moments in life, dying alone and afraid, burning with the need for revenge, define everything he is after his transformation. 
Originally, Man-Thing burnt everything it touched, regardless of how the subject felt. But the editor, Roy Thomas, changed that power after the first few initial appearances because, well, that really limited the character's ability to interact with the environment. With this established, Gerber would add that Man-Thing is an empathic creature, which is motivated by instinct more than anything. It had the most rudimentary ability to make a decision based on the emotional quality in the air. However, if the emotions it felt were contradictory or too complex, it usually didn't do anything. It lacked the ability to assess a situation, then make a moral decision. Of course, this wasn't absolute, because, well, the plot did have to move forward at some point, and if Man-Thing was required to fulfill that duty, it did. Gerber also added the idea that Man-Thing was probably created because the swamp happened to be the location of the nexus of all realities, and that nexus needed a protector. This is something that's not really defined, but it is thoroughly implied. And the nexus of all realities is, well, exactly what it sounds like on the box. It's the location where the gajillions of realities in the universe converge. This convergence creates a soft spot in reality itself, and some forces attempt to manipulate the soft spot for their own evil purposes. But Man-Thing is there to prevent this from happening. For the most part, the nexus of all realities just sits in the background, and it is barely mentioned again after the first few issues of the Man-Thing solo series. The Man-Thing solo series, which started in 1974, was entirely written by Steve Gerber, and it lasted for 22 issues. Gerber also mainly wrote the five-issue quarterly series, Giant Size Man-Thing. And while those two solo titles were being published, Man-Thing also appeared in the black and white magazine, Monsters Unleashed, although those stories were handled by other writers. Basically, Man-Thing was all over the Marvel Universe between 1972 and 1975. Man-Thing was so popular, it was even the subject of a Power Records read-along book in 1974. This adaptation covers the two-issue story, Night of the Laughing Dead, from Man-Thing number 5 and number 6. If you so desire, there's a link in the description below where you can listen to this creepy adaptation. The bulk of the stories Gerber wrote were either satirical and strange, or they were morality plays. What makes the morality plays interesting is that Gerber doesn't settle for making either side of the moral issue completely right in their position. The antagonist and the protagonist are both a little right, and they're both a little wrong. Sure, the protagonist always has the morally correct position, and they always come out on top. I mean, this is a comic book from the 70s, after all. You sort of have to expect that. The series is also notable for containing the first appearance of Howard the Duck, who is promptly killed off, the psychologically questionable Fool Killer, and the Superman parody Wondar. In the final issue of the series, Steve Gerber himself appears in order to team up with Man-Thing and to save the universe. There is a fair amount to unpack in that issue. It's a story told entirely from Gerber's point of view, as he writes a letter to the Man-Thing editor, Len Wein, explaining why he can no longer write the Man-Thing title. In a nutshell, all the Man-Thing tales were his interpretation of stories the sorcerer Dakim told him once he accepted the Man-Thing writing assignment. During the course of the issue, he and Man-Thing are trapped in a nightmare box together and become the final piece in a tower built out of nightmare boxes. However, because both Gerber and Man-Thing are beings capable of overcoming emotion with reason, this destroys the tower instead of empowering it. Yeah, the message being, reason conquers even the darkest emotional possibility. Which, in hindsight, appears to be the theme of the entire Man-Thing series. Despite the positive outcome of the story, Gerber felt that writing the series put his life in jeopardy, and it was something he needed to put behind him. That's the reason he was choosing to end his run on Man-Thing. Gerber has said in interviews, the reason he chose to write himself into the series was because he felt a personal connection to the readers, and he wanted to give them a personal goodbye when he left the series, rather than writing a slightly impersonal goodbye text piece in the letter column of that issue. With that, the first Man-Thing series concluded. The second solo Man-Thing series would begin in 1979 for an 11-issue run that was mainly written by the X-Men writer Chris Claremont. In the final issue, Claremont decided to maintain the tradition established by Steve Gerber, and he wrote himself into the story to explain to the editor why he was done with the series. It's a somewhat disingenuous attempt on Claremont's part, though, considering the series had been cancelled anyway. Following the conclusion of that series, Man-Thing would essentially remain in limbo until 1997. It would be featured in Marvel Comics Presents twice, and, of course, it made various appearances in a variety of other titles. Man-Thing would get his final solo series in 1997 with an 8-issue run by Jim DeMatis and Liam Sharp. 
This series mainly focused on the woman, Ellen Brandt, who had originally sold Ted Sellis out to AIM and had been the indirect cause of his transformation into Man-Thing. These eight issues are a very earnest attempt to recontextualize Man-Thing and to find it a place within the dark corners of the Marvel Universe. This was something Marvel was kinda sorta trying to establish in the 90s with all their supernatural characters, like Ghost Rider and Son of Satan. At the time, the series just couldn't sustain an audience, and it was cancelled a few times during the run, before it abruptly ended in the middle of a story in issue number 8. And the grand mythology Demades had been building was completely ignored and practically erased by Marvel Comics. Again, Man-Thing returned to limbo until it appeared in a three-issue miniseries in 2004. This miniseries was a direct tie-in to the 2005 Man-Thing motion picture, that almost no one has heard about and even fewer have seen, myself included. A few years later, Man-Thing's origin would get an adult reboot in 2008 with the Marvel Max miniseries, Dead of Night. Then, in 2010, Man-Thing would become part of the Thunderbolts team with issue number 144. For the most part, Man-Thing is used as a power source to bounce a Quinjet through realities because, you know, it's connected to the nexus of all realities. At the end of its run on the team, in issue number 162, Man-Thing is basically killed off. Satana transforms him into an egg type of thing that will show up again in the Dark Avengers. In the pages of the Dark Avengers, Man-Thing is dramatically changed for the first time since 1971. Essentially, the Thunderbolts end up way, way back in time when Earth was a protein soup. This soup fertilizes the Man-Thing egg and it rises once more, but with an intelligence and the capability to speak. Apparently, its destiny, large question mark there, was to drop back in time to become the first intelligence on the planet. Sure, okay, why not? As far as I can tell, this is the character's status as it stands today. Intelligent, able to speak, and it can hop through time. However, despite the status change, there have been two subsequent miniseries that don't take note of the character's evolution. The first is the posthumous three-issue miniseries, Infernal Man-Thing, that was published in 2012. A script by Steve Gerber, one he wrote in the 80s as a direct sequel to issue number 12 of the original Man-Thing series, was finally completed by the artist Kevin Nolan. For reasons I couldn't find anywhere online, Kevin Nolan, who had been given the assignment back in the 80s, didn't finish work on it until after Steve Gerber had passed away. Gerber's death actually inspired Nolan to finish it, and Marvel, to their credit, published it once it was completed. It's a well-written coda to a character that Gerber clearly identified with, and Gerber probably felt a need to give the character a sense of closure. It's a very intimate story about a man that tried to be normal, but that white picket fence life came at the cost of his creativity, and this basically drove him past the point of tolerance. He's inspired to return to the swamp and to, basically, write himself to death. As a coda, as a place for me to finish on a good note, this would be the place I'd prefer to stop. But, instead, I have one final miniseries to get through. Popular young adult horror writer R.L. Stein wrote a five-issue Man-Thing miniseries in 2017. I mean, it's pretty terrible. Objectively, if you were ten years old, had no knowledge of the Man-Thing character whatsoever, and were in the mood for a goofy, nonsensical adventure that goes absolutely nowhere, then this is the series for you. I'm guessing this miniseries is in line with the R.L. Stein brand of stories because it just lacks any appeal at all, like to anyone with a functional brain. It's just crammed with bad dialogue, a plot that forgets what it's doing, idiotic poo jokes, and it stops at a point that I think was intended to be ironic, but is just dumb. In the end, Man-Thing is another oddity in the Marvel stable of characters. It just doesn't seem to fit anywhere but it has managed to linger in the fringes of that universe for over 40 years, making no shortage of appearances in various titles. For the most part, Man-Thing is an enigmatic challenge that I think most writers have tried to solve over the years. It has a solid origin and a lot of potential, but I think that potential has been hard to actualize. I think the largest contributing factor to this challenge is what Alan Moore did with Swamp Thing in the early 80s. That was a massive game-changing overhaul that stands as a classic adult horror series to this day. And the challenge is, how do you do that with Man-Thing and not look like you're copying Swamp Thing? That's a tough one, right? The character's evolution in Dark Avengers as a time-hopping, intelligent creature is not entirely dissimilar to Swamp Thing, but at the same time, it's not a concept that's fully fleshed out either. So, perhaps in the future, in a dark corner of the Marvel Universe, 
Man-Thing may become more than its origin. Until next time.